Welcome. Welcome to Vanadium. I'm Chris Rankin. The more I learn about this mad world, the more mysterious it seems. Is there a scientific basis for the idea of a Manchurian candidate, a brainwashed automaton with their personality completely overridden, soul replaced, someone acting on behalf of someone else's volition? There's definitely an element of sensationalism in the popular culture, but this idea does seem to have some basis in reality. Brainwashing has also been called mind control, meant to side. That sounds bad. Also, coercive persuasion and re-education. It's based on the concept that the human mind can be modified or controlled using psychological techniques and the scientific method. Brainwashing reduces a victim's ability to think critically and independently. It can introduce new, unwanted thoughts and ideas into their minds and change their attitudes, values, and beliefs. The term brainwashing was first introduced to the English language by Edward Hunter in 1950 to describe how the Chinese government seemed to gain rapid, inexplicable cooperation from some political prisoners. Research into mind control also focused on Nazi Germany, at some criminal cases in the United States, and at the actions of human traffickers. In the 1960s and 1970s, there was considerable media attention, as well as scientific and legal debate about the possibility of brainwashing being a factor when psychoactive drugs were used in the conversion of people to some new religious movements or cults. Brainwashing is sometimes mentioned in lawsuits, especially in the realm of child custody disputes, but the term is not generally accepted in the technical literature. It is a well-explored theme in science fiction, however. I think of Clockwork Orange, with Malcolm McDowell going from ruthless predator to passive victim of the same gang of droogs he used to lead. All it took was some re-education at the hands of some nice men in white lab coats. Those guys should always be trusted. On the softer, lighter side of brainwashing, Propaganda is a tool used by every government and large organization on planet Earth, distorting the idea of what's normal, what's moral, and often the basic facts about what's going on in the first place. Propaganda creates a shift in attitude and opinion by distorting and overblowing some dangers while ignoring those dripping with impending doom. Brainwashing in this form is alive and well in the 21st century media. Exaggerating threats simplifying answers, obfuscating reality, mixing lies with the truth. That used to be Satan's job, but the corporate media is enthusiastically taking on these responsibilities. There is also Stockholm Syndrome, where hostages come to identify with and even care for their captors in a desperate, usually unconscious act of self-preservation. It occurs in the most psychologically traumatic situations. And what's interesting, its effects do not usually end when the crisis ends. In most classic cases, victims continue to defend and care about their captors even after they escape captivity. Symptoms of Stockholm Syndrome have even been identified in battered spouse cases and in members of destructive cults. The term was based on a 1973 case where two men entered the Credit Bank and Bank in Stockholm, Sweden with the intent of robbing the place. When the plan went awry, and the police entered the bank unexpectedly. The robbers shot them, and a hostage situation ensued. For six days, the robbers held four people at gunpoint, locked in a bank vault. Sometimes the captors even strapped the hostages down with explosives, and other times forced them to put nooses around their necks. When the police did eventually attempt a rescue, the hostages actually fought them off. The hostages defended their captors, and in fact, blamed the police. After the crisis was over, one of the freed hostages even set up a fund to cover the robber's legal defense fees. Thus, the term Stockholm Syndrome was born, and psychologists everywhere had a name for this classic captor-prisoner phenomenon. One of the early pioneers in the idea of brainwashing, Joost Mierlu, a Dutch psychiatrist, referred to it as menticide, meaning killing of the mind. Mierlu's view was influenced by his experiences during the German occupation of his country 
and his work with the American military in the interrogation of accused Nazi war criminals. He later moved to the United States and taught at Columbia University. His best-selling 1956 book, The Rape of the Mind, concludes by saying, the modern techniques of brainwashing and menticide, those perversions of psychology, can bring almost any man into submission and surrender. Many of the victims of thought control, brainwashing, and menticide that we have talked about were strong men whose minds and wills were broken and degraded. But although the totalitarians used their knowledge of the mind for vicious and unscrupulous purposes, our democratic society can and must use its knowledge to help man grow, to guard his freedom, and to understand himself. On previous episodes of the show, I've mentioned the Am Shinrikyo cult and how they manufactured their own chemical weapons for a massive attack on the Japanese subway system in 1995. The people in the cult thought they were saving Japan and bringing salvation. I've also talked about mass hysteria or conversion disorder, where groups of people can share the same hallucinations and even the same physical symptoms temporarily due purely to psychological forces. Brainwashing is based on distortion of what's moral, what's right and wrong, what's the acceptable standard for belief and behavior. Another core component is fear with a threat to survival, physical and psychological. In 1929, Mao Zedong, who would later lead the Chinese Communist Party, used the phrase Su Sang Tu Cheng, which translates to thought struggle to describe the process of brainwashing. Political prisoners in China were reportedly subjected to communist conversion techniques as a matter of regular practice. I mentioned the term brainwashing was first used by Edward Hunter in the 50s to describe POWs during the Korean War. Hunter introduced the concept at a time when Americans were already freaking out. It was the Cold War, and America was in a state of panic at the idea of mass communist indoctrination through brainwashing. People thought they might be converted and not even know it. In the aftermath of the Korean War, the U.S. government was also freaking out that it might be falling behind in mind control research. In 1953, the CIA began a program called MKUltra. In one of the studies, the CIA apparently gave subjects, including the famed Timothy Leary, LSD in order to study the effects of mind-altering drugs and gauge their effectiveness in brainwashing. The results were reportedly not very impressive, and a number of test subjects were harmed by these experiments. Other lucky test subjects of these experiments include Ted Kaczynski, Allen Ginsberg, James Whitey Bulger, Sirhan Sirhan, who was convicted of murdering Robert F. Kennedy, and Charles Manson. Drug experimentation by the CIA was officially ordered to a halt by Congress in the 70s, although some claim clandestine research still goes on. Psychologist Robert J. Lifton studied former prisoners of the Korean War and Chinese war camps in an effort to understand the systematic steps they went through during the course of their mind control. He determined they'd undergone a multi-phase process that began with attacks on the prisoner's sense of self and ended with what appeared to be a change in beliefs. Lifton defined this set of steps involved in the brainwashing cases he studied. Each of these stages takes place in an environment of social isolation, and confusion-inducing techniques like sleep deprivation and malnutrition are typically sprinkled in as part of the process. There is often the presence or constant threat of physical harm, which adds to the target's difficulty in thinking critically and independently. We can divide the process Lipton identified into roughly three stages. Stage one, breaking down the self. This involves an assault on personal identity. You are not who you think you are. This stage involves a systematic attack on a target's sense of self, the ego, the core belief system. The brainwasher denies everything that makes the target who he is. You are not a soldier. You are not a man. You are not defending freedom. The target is under constant attack for days, weeks, or months to the point of exhaustion, confusion, and disorientation. Then comes the power of guilt. The target hears, you are bad. The agent repeatedly and mercilessly attacks the subject for any real or imagined sin the target has ever committed 
large or small. The agent may criticize the target for everything from the immorality of his beliefs to personal hygiene. The target begins to feel a generalized sense of shame. Once the subject is disoriented and suffering in guilt, the agent forces them to verbally denounce family, friends, and peers who share the same wrong belief system. This betrayal of personal beliefs and of people the subject feels a sense of loyalty to works to worsen the experience of shame and loss of identity. Then comes the breaking point. Who am I? Where am I? What am I supposed to do? With the target's identity in crisis, subjected to deep shame, and the target having betrayed everything they know, they may then undergo what used to be called a nervous breakdown. In psychology, nervous breakdown is a constellation of severe symptoms indicating any number of psychological disturbances. It may involve uncontrollable sobbing, difficulty communicating, deep depression, and general disorientation. At this point, the target may have lost their grip on reality with the feeling of being completely lost and alone. Then, the agent sets up the temptation to convert to another belief system that will save the target from this current misery. Now comes stage two, the possibility of salvation. First, the brainwasher shows mercy. With the target in a state of crisis and despair, the agent offers some small kindness or reprieve from the abuse. He may offer the target a simple drink of water or take a moment to ask the target how they are feeling or what they miss about home. In a state of nervous breakdown, even the small kindness seems huge and the target may experience a sense of relief and gratitude completely out of proportion to the offering. The target might feel as though the agent has saved their life. Next, the brainwasher offers an opportunity for confession. For the first time in the brainwashing process, the target is faced with the contrast between the guilt and pain of the identity assault and the sudden relief of forgiveness and a new beginning. The target may experience a drive to reciprocate the kindness offered to them. And at this point, the agent may present the possibility of a confession as a means to further relieve guilt and pain. Releasing the guilt is a key step. The embattled target is relieved to learn that there is an external cause of his wrongness, that they are not inescapably and irredeemably bad. This means they can escape the wrongness just by escaping the wrong belief system. All they have to do is denounce the people and institutions associated with that belief system, and all the pain will be gone. The target has the power to release themselves from the agony associated with this form of belief system. With a confession, the target completes their psychological rejection of their former identity. This is when the agent is ready to offer the target a new one. Now comes stage three, rebuilding the self. Once those critical early stages of brainwashing are complete, it's time to move on to a more harmonious, but ultimately destructive relationship. The target is presented with a path to progress and harmony. They are told, if you want, you can choose good. At this stage, the agent stops the abuse, offering the target physical comfort and calm in conjunction with the new belief system. The target is made to feel that it is he who must choose between the old and the new, giving the target the sense that his fate is in his own hands. The choice is not a difficult one. The new identity is safe and desirable because it is nothing like the one that led to the nervous breakdown. Next comes the final confession and rebirth. The target says, I choose good. Contrasting the agony of the old with the relief of the new, the target chooses and clings to the new identity. They reject the old belief system and pledge allegiance to the new. At this final stage, there are often rituals or ceremonies to induct the converted target into their new community. This stage has been described by some brainwashing victims as a feeling of rebirth. Lifton created this three-phase description from first-hand accounts of the techniques used by captors in the Korean War and other instances of brainwashing around the same time. Since Lifton and other psychologists have identified variations on what appears to be a distinct set of steps leading to a profound state of suggestibility, an interesting question is why some people end up brainwashed and others don't. 
certain personality traits of brainwashing targets seem to determine the effectiveness of the process. People who commonly experience great self-doubt, who have a weak sense of identity, and show a tendency toward black and white thinking are more likely to be successfully brainwashed. With a strong sense of identity and self-confidence, this can make you more resistant to the brainwashing process. Mental detachment is one of the POW survival techniques now taught to soldiers as part of their training. It involves the target psychologically removing himself from his physical surroundings through visualization, repetition of a mantra, and various other meditative techniques. The military also teaches soldiers about the methods used in brainwashing because the target's knowledge of the process tends to make it less effective. While the U.S. learned about brainwashing in the 50s in the aftermath of the Korean War, the ideas and techniques had been around for longer than that. Scholars have traced the roots of systematic mind control to the prison camps of communist Russia in the early 1900s when political prisoners were routinely re-educated to the communist view of the world. But it was after the practice spread to China and the writings of Chairman Mao Zedong that the world really started to take notice. This period in time also marked the beginning of the military studies into psychological torture, and after a while, they started to come to a rather dark conclusion. That in most cases, the subjects hadn't been brainwashed, they had simply been the victims of torture. This resulted in the military developing a new plan they called Survival Evasion Resistance Escape Program, meant to inoculate the men against future attempts at psychological torture by using identical torture techniques in their training. I guess that is one way to deal with it. I suppose you could fight fire with fire. Despite the tragedy and infamy of MKUltra, and the project's violation of ethical norms for human experiments, the legacy of brainwashing experiments continues to live on in the policies of many governments around the world, including the U.S. The same methods that had once used to train American soldiers ended up being used to extract information from terrorists in Abu Ghraib, Iraq, and Guantanamo Bay. The tools of brainwashing have long been applied to the manufacture of propaganda. Cases of Stockholm Syndrome persist. The scientific method has a dark side. Psychology research can be used to empower or destroy, to move the world forward or one more step back toward another dark age. Modern science has created the tools but supplied no moral guidance for how to use them. As the human race gains technological ability, it's becoming more and more important to understand the moral implications of revolutionary innovation and to guard against the influence of evil. Thank you very much. This was Chris Rankin with Vanadium.